The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a place for us to go here and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this moment. And for those new faces uh, here today or watching this on YouTube, um, no one knows what the Stoa is. Some call it a digital campfire, a communal podcast, a wisdom gym. Uh, it's better not to know, I sense. Uh, one thing we do know is it is a place that we do not talk about Stoicism. Um, and uh, today we have Keith Johnstone with us. Uh, Keith is a pioneer of the improv theater movement. Uh, he's known for an in inventing uh, the impro system and the author of uh, this legendary book, Impro. Um, and his work has kind of formed a, a cult status uh, and a wider audience that extends well beyond the theater community. Uh, Venkatesh Rao from Ribbon Farm, I'll read a quote uh, from him uh, when he wrote about Keith's book. Impro is ostensibly a book about improv and the theater, depending on where you're coming from. It might be no more than that, or it might be a near religious experience. <laughs> so how um, today is gonna work, uh, Keith and I are gonna chat for maybe about 10 to 20 minutes. And if you have any questions, throw them in the chat box. Um, I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question to Keith. If you don't wanna be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, just indicate that um, and I'll read on your behalf. Can I tell you afterwards? How's it going, Keith? Oh, you mean it goes out live on YouTube? Uh, it goes afterwards on YouTube oh. afterwards. Or... Can I tell you afterwards? <laughs> so how are you doing today? I'm okay. Uh, where are you speaking from? I'm from Toronto, Canada. And oh, wow. yeah. A couple and, of hours away from us. Yeah, just, just a few. Um, so I thought I'd ask uh, like a really broad question to start with um, and feel free to swat it away or ask me that. The sound is cut out. Someone muted me. Uh, yeah, um, I thought I'd ask you a, a general question to start with um, and feel free to swat it away or, or ask something or ask me to ask you something more specific. Um, but I thought it'd be good just to inquire into your life's work. Like if someone is coming new to it and I imagine the people in this room are, um, how would you describe your system or your book, uh, Impro? Uh, it's been called a system ever since Teresa produced a book on me, but I don't really see it as being a system. I see it more as an attitude of mind. Uh, I don't see improvisation. I don't see improvisation, it makes me annoyed now. Uh, it's not what I wanted. I detest light entertainment. I think it's terrible. I think it's a byproduct of, of the education system. I think is a revulsion against education, basically. All those hours and hours in school of organized boredom. Um, unhappy teachers, unhappy kids. So, I think that stress is attached to learning. So learning for pleasure, it's a sort of alien concept to a lot of people. To, to relax, they have to have light entertainment, which basically teaches nothing. Like chatting to actresses on late night shows or whatever. I mean, David Letterman's um, producer did say, and I quote him, <laughs> if you learn anything of value from watching our program, we failed in our purpose. As I think, knowledge is very difficult to get rid of the uh, curiosity of an ape. But a lot of adults, a lot of professors in the university were really not curious. I mean, that they've suffered so much learning the stuff that they just want to go and have a beer in the pub, something to calm them down. So I think, 
I did find a thing on the TV the other day. If you typed in Michael Moore and Finland and education, you'd find it. About the Finns, who at one time had the brightest students in the world. I think it's not true anymore, but it must have gone to Japan where they flogged them. But they cancelled homework and they just did four hours a day. And <laughs> they tried to make education pleasurable and instead of whipping the slaves to the to the mill. So I'm not sure was that a question? Whatever it was, uh, I liked uh, your response. Um, so I'm just going to pivot to the questions in the chat right now because we have a lot. Uh, L Red, you have a question for Keith. If you're going to mute yourself. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just heard you say that uh, your work is not a system and shouldn't be used like that. How would you like to see your work used? Well, I think it's like a wheel with spokes and some of the spokes are mine and you pick a spoke and you're trying to get to the center of the wheel and if one spoke starts working you move to another one and you try absolutely anything. But once it's a system it's like we start with this and we go to that and we go to this and you can have a syllabus. Um, they have syllabuses in drama teaching and they'll have three, three months on improvisation, somewhere near the beginning of the course, which is crazy because of course you should, improvisation should be part of the whole process from beginning to end. You shouldn't isolate it for three months, maybe a week of improvisation and then you refer back to it and gradually increase the knowledge. So I don't think you can really have a syllabus for improvisation and universities, of course, and colleges always want that and schools want that. And it's not the nature of the beast. Hello? <clears throat> Hello? Yeah. 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 Elred, do you have any follow up? I guess not. Uh, I, <clears throat> I think wheel and spoke answers my question. And keep going back to the wheel and, and spending time, spending the time that it, the beast requires. I think answers my question. All right. Thank you. Uh, maybe Gray, you're up next. Hi, Keith. I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, so appreciative that you'd uh, be willing to visit our little community. Um, I've studied uh, psychology and a, a lot of what I learned in uh, life step and developmental psychology was that children learn through playing. Um, but something that I didn't see emphasized in that context was that we all learn through playing. And so I was wondering uh, if you have an opinion about for you, what the most important connection between playing and learning is? Well, you can make anything, you can make anything into a game. Uh, and you can be playful. Uh, I think when I was 11, some teacher probably still suffering from post-traumatic stuff from the Great War. Um, a man with no joy in his life. He should have been treated, I think. He came in and he wrote the world algebra on the blackboard. And he said, you've had it easy up till now. Now this is going to be really difficult. What a guy. On the other hand, when Einstein was about four or five, he, did, he had this nice uncle who said there was this game we're going to play where you hunt a creature called X and when you capture it, it has to tell you its name. So there you can see two 
two ends of the candle or whatever, two ends of the rod, two ends of the cane, the nice end and the nasty end. But a lot of my education were by ex-soldiers. So there, it was a sort of military attitude where you just had to obey and do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, my, me and another boy were given some physics experiment to to measure the uh, <clears throat> to time the cooling of boiling water. God, that's boring. <laughs> but, but and then he said, join join up between all the points smoothly, and all the bars were slightly off. <clears throat> so we did curving lines to join up the points. And the physics master, the Reverend Smee, uh, came and yelled at us for doing that. But he could have said, hey, that's amazing. I'd never seen results like this before. <laughs> could you check them again? That's astounding. My God, you may be onto something here. I mean, you could have a playful attitude. So, but no. But the Finns seem to have conquered that. They seem to have understood. I haven't worked in Finland for a long time, so it probably wasn't me. I did read a book called Summer Hill once. You may know about that. Can't remember. Now I'm so old, I can't remember any names. Neil. Neil, yes. But the, the one thing about Neil is that he just wanted children to be, to be democratic and to have a good time. But he didn't think it was abnormal if they didn't have a passion for learning. And I would say, if you don't have a passion for learning, you're severely damaged and that damage should be healed. Yeah, it's, it's strange to me how in like formal public education so often playing is considered the disruption to learning and not the path to it. And it's nice to see people like you who are able to recognize that that's not the most natural way of looking at it. So thank you so much. Next. All right. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Robin Hansen. Uh, past guest the Stoa, um, Robin, if you can unmute yourself. Hi there, uh, nice to meet you. Um, you are mentioned in our book, The Elephant in the Brain, if you'd ever like to check it out. Uh, my question is, uh, in psychology, when people talk about status, they distinguish usually two kinds of status. There's dominance and prestige. You have a lot of insightful commentary in your book about status moves, but you don't distinguish status and uh, dominance and prestige. Uh, do status moves differ according to those kinds of status or not? And if so, how? Well, I was a shy young man when I did all this stuff. And I didn't want to shout dominate and submit. I mean, I wouldn't feel that was my style at the actors. So I decided to call it status, but and I guess it's like jargon in a way. I try to avoid jargon. In my view, the status is what you do to somebody else. It's not what you are. So in theater, quite often the, especially in theater of the absurd, high status people will play low status to the slave or something. Uh, they get the, they exploit the wrong status for laughs or tragic things. It's um, is that great Japanese thing about going through the gate? I think Kurosawa did two versions of it, but I'm getting sidetracked. But where the the servant beats up the master, who's dressed as a servant as they go through the gate at some moment when the deception is about to be discovered. But anyway, it's part of theater. But I think we were shocked 
this all this information was well known as it was certainly from research in 1922 in Denmark on Danish chickens. Uh, it's just a, and it's it's a blindingly obvious thing is once you know that is to teach it, teach actors to change their level of status. And it was unconsciously known about all good playwrights. Good plays are demonstrations of status transactions, really. Uh, most people can't write plays because they think it's literature. And also they won't have the characters altered. I mean, drama is that one person changes another or you don't have any drama. <laughs> one of the reasons I'm bored stiff by improvisation is that nobody's ever changed. They're frightened so they go on the stage to be strong and they somehow think that means not to be altered. So it's not a very dramatic form, mostly people singing songs or improvising songs or making jokes, but nothing ever happens. Because happens in drama means someone's altered. Shakespeare was very good at that. If you tell a nun you're going to execute her brother unless she fucks you, uh, that's going to cause some changes, but not in improvisation. The nun will say, not again, <laughs> and protect herself, because if she says not again, she doesn't have to be altered. <clears throat> or Macbeth, Shakespeare has him incredibly altered. He comes in to the feast with and sees Duncan's ghost and he gets carried out feet first. I mean, you can't be more altered than that, but. So can I follow up, uh, Peter? Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering so, on that. Uh, <laughs> so so um, it sounds like you're mostly talking about dominance when, when you're talking, but let me give a concrete example so you can clarify. Uh, according to the usual norms, if somebody is dominant, it's not okay to look directly at their eyes because that's a challenge to them and they have to respond to your challenge. But if they're prestigious, it's okay to look directly at them and that's, that's acceptable because uh, you, know, you are admiring them and celebrating them by looking at them. So uh, which of those two is a status move? Well, I think all the books are wrong about this. Uh, well, maybe not now, but back in the 60s, my God, what a long time ago, back in the 60s, I think it said if you, the person who looks away first is the weaker. But in fact, if you look away first, the message can be, I'm not afraid of you. I can ignore you. Well, teachers have a special status where they can look into eyes, but they mustn't look for too long into anybody's eyes. But let me, I'm losing this track here, poor old gentleman. Um, it's, the thing is, if you look away from somebody and you take a quick look back, that's devastating. <laughs> but they didn't say that in those days. Maybe they do now. But you can try it. You, you look away from someone and you're strong. You take quick looks back uh, <laughs> and you start to crumble physically. So that's, that's it. It's more complicated, this I thing, than people think. Uh, and the blinking is so important. We're counting the blink rate all the time. Something, something in us is counting the blink rate. <clears throat> uh, yes, does that answer your question? A bit, <laughs> enough. All right. Uh, status is in many forms. It's not just one thing. It's like there's what the body expresses. Uh, you can be dominant with a very submissive body, uh, like a savage cripple taking down some aristocrat. Uh, it's 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 not just one set of things. It's it's the whole animal, it's nothing a human being does which doesn't tend to affect the power between them. 
when I was young, they didn't seem to know why there was a kinetic dance. <clears throat> that is, between human beings, <clears throat> if you film them secretly and speed up the film afterwards, it looks like they're dancing because one person uh, relates their body movements to the other persons. <clears throat> and it's really, f I wanted to ask Desmond Morris that, I didn't. <clears throat> I was going to have dinner with him, but I just had a long talk with him in a taxi. His sister was ill. But it was on my list of things to ask. Because he said the kinetic dance were timed within a 45th of a second, which is ridiculous. And I couldn't imagine why it would have evolved to be so fast. Except it is life or death. Uh, but I mean, if you... <clears throat> If you put your hand out like that, where are you? Yes, okay. It's totally different than doing it like that. Somebody used to teach politicians to do that. Oh, Obama was interesting because he was a community organizer and he didn't want to be dominant when he started. And they all said he wasn't presidential enough for about a year. And he used to waggle his head about and he would make gestures with the thumb alongside the hand and his solution was to make less gestures but if someone had told him put your thumb out he could have yeah it would have been nice to do but anyway i think all politicians should probably have acting lessons or at least lessons in this stuff and Clever ones do, but they don't always get the nicest acting teachers. I mean, Clinton obviously had some speech therapist to come in. Because in the end, he could talk without losing his voice. All right. Um, I'll take in my fellow meta tribalist, uh, Tyler. Uh, you're up next. Uh, so I woke up this morning and I was trying to find myself and it turned out that I was somewhere between my neck and the top of my scalp, which was interesting because that's not my entire body. And then when I asked for contributions to my sense of consciousness from the rest of my body, I found that my lower body was higher status than my upper body and that I became a totally different person also when I integrated the two and uh, put them less to war. And so this, this is the, the thing I read about in your book that struck me the most, the moving of the eye around or of, of basic consciousness or something like that. Um, and typically when I have people try it, put their eye in their finger or at the other end of the room, they have a psychedelic experience. Um, what about this one with the, the silver ball in the chest? The silver boy? Pumping out light. A silver ball. I haven't tried In that. your chest, oh. which is pumping light out. Try that. That's a really that's the most the most positive. Very intense. <laughs> it's fun. You should try try it at parties. Try it in bars, and you get served quicker. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to have to play a hero. You ought to play Hamlet, or Siegfried, or somebody. You know, high status person. It, it opens your chest up, and it. I guess manages you. I sometimes, I, I can't do this much, but I sometimes wake up and try not to move the muscle. That's weird. <laughs> well, when you wake up, you move a muscle to take possession of the body again. You know, like, it's what you do. Nobody wakes up and doesn't move a muscle. But if you can possibly not do it, then you enter a slightly odd state. Anyway, but that I have various forms of fun, which may not be fun to other people. I would say you, we don't really know what status you are until you meet another person. It's basically interactive. That's how we judge it. I guess you could be low status to the room or low status to the sofa. You won't sit back on it. You sit there with your toes pointing on the edge of the sofa. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You can be, you can be low status, but we have to test it by somebody coming into the room. If you then spread yourself a bit, we know that your status is really higher. 
Anyway, who was it? Somebody, Norman, I think, wrote The Horse Whisperer. And he, as a 13 year old boy, watched horses, wild horses out on the prairie. And he discovered there was nothing at all that, that a horse did that wasn't significant. And we did the same thing, we all. Uh, I got into this by tr asking actors to find the smallest possible purpose in relation to another actor. And for months I've been trying to get human behavior and they could do, especially in Germany, they could do wonderful things as actors, except look human. But then I said, can you, can you try to be a little teeny bit less important than the person you're talking to or a tiny bit more? And there it was, human behavior. Wow. <laughs> then, then for two weeks we suffered because you couldn't ask a question without somebody saying, why are you asking that question? And all our secret maneuverings were exposed. And we became much friendlier. <laughs> because friends play status shifts for fun. Acquaintances can't do that. You can't call your friends, you can't say, get out your old cow, if you're an acquaintance. Only if it's a friend. So if you make them play status games, they get much friendlier. Then there's the problem of what do you do when you let them out into the world again, which is not a very friendly place. If they spent 10 days getting friendly. I never solved that. Thank There's you, Tyler. a strange delay on this, but that's it just the technology, is it? I shouldn't read it as a message. We're just in awe uh, of you. Uh, it sounds Keith. like you're <laughs> bouncing off the moon. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you, uh, Tyler. Um, I'm going to take in Luke. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, hi, Keith. I'm wondering, it seems to me like for some people, when they get this concept of status and sort of put on these goggles, their whole world becomes darker and more Machiavellian and everything becomes kind of unwholesome and unhealthy and it becomes this really toxic thing. And then for some people not, and when you talk about status and improv, that was the first time that I'd really heard that concept evoked in a way where I felt like, oh, but it could be okay that this is all happening, this sub subterranean maneuvering, and it could be fun. And maybe I've sort of answered my question is, is there's play there, but I wonder how, if you see people get kind of swallowed up by this status beast and if you kind of see a difference that leads some people to internalize this concept and kind of metabolize it. If we're going to do, if we're going to introduce status to people, I usually warn them they're going to feel odd for a while, but that after a couple of weeks, everything had just come back to normal. It just becomes part of everyday life. Um, I have a problem I haven't solved and I can't really do it now because, uh, but I was teaching, I gave a class to John Marston in Australia to, at his school to 10 and 11 year olds, just experimentally to see what it could be like. And I started with some status master servant would have been all right that's not essentially a status thing but then i i veered away from it because i'm in the middle of telling them the secrets of human behavior and then i thought is it right to know this when you're age 10 how machiavellian are you going to get so i had exactly the same feeling that you had about it but certainly for students and grown-ups, if they understand it, they go through a process where they feel like robots. So everybody's like a robot because you see, you can see what the person's doing and they have no knowledge of what they're doing. It's just that they're doing their normal status stuff. And an awful thing is that you often assume that you're playing a status that you're not. Like... If you're afraid of other people, you think you're low status. 
But no, if you're afraid of other people, you're probably high to keep them at a distance, keep them away, repel them. So when you start playing the games, just doing it for fun, you get inside. At the moment, I'm thinking that probably, I, I wish that I had this insight when I was age 10. So I'm tending to think that is probably a good thing, but someone should do some research on it. Not much research in theatre, it's mostly people's opinion. It's because they, you know, they, they put drama into the universities where it doesn't really belong. It's, or the arts. Instead of demanding research where you might have learned something, they just call your research the weight of the marble you sculpted or something. I mean, there's not research. And I'd like to know stuff, I mean. So. Yeah, thanks, that, that really answers it. I'm, I don't know, the fantasy of research is like mapping out sort of phases of understanding of status. There's sort of, you know, when Edward Bond's play Save was coming on, I was an associate director of the Royal Court Theatre and I wrote to New Society saying this was going to be very interesting sociologically. This is going to cause all kinds of ripples. So could they consider it as a project, yeah? And what they did was they sent a drama critic they didn't understand anything. And you just wrote a review. That wasn't very much fun. I mean, people can't imagine doing research. I imagine, though, if you did turn it into a research project, it, you could pretty easily suck the play out of it. Well, you could wire the audience up. I don't know, to some sort of primitive, um, emotional, I know, something to study skin. Oh yes, that's right, we did once have uh, only 72 buttons to give out to the audience. And the rest of the audience didn't have the buttons, so we had to stop it because the guys without buttons would get really annoyed. But then, uh, you can see the numbers jump up and down. And that that's when I could explain to my actors that I was actually right and that um, what I was telling them was correct. They kill an idea and the numbers would go down to 10 from 72. Mm. Or they, they do some other improvisation fault. So I got, I got, I got much more confident then. So, but I, I, I would, I would like more facts. I'd, I'd, I get the feeling that well, science books, give, they, they give experiments and that's interesting and that's real. But if I pick up a, I mean, I never studied literature, but if I pick up one of those books, they quite often imitate science by giving opinions in the footnotes. But to hell with opinion, I want fact. And an opinion is not a fact. So I think they're imitating science, but it's a con. I think I did, whatever the question was, I'm not answering it anymore. Yeah, you answered it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Andy, you had a question. He, he wrote two chapters on spontaneity and narrative skill. Um, in these days when we converse with people often that we naturally disagree with, how can we use spontaneity you're, hang on. and narrative skill? Whoa, whoa, you're a bit quiet. With people we can you speak up? I can't hear you. I, I'm going to mute you, Andy, and I'll, I'll read your question on your behalf. Um, so Andy said, uh, how can spontaneity and narrative skill be used to help us better converse with people we naturally disagree with? Or maybe how they can be repurposed in, in, in domains outside of improv. Oh, I have no idea. 
there's always a temptation to make up an answer, but not getting emotional with people. You, I mean, it's, it's another thing. It's being playful. Uh, it gets like life or death. It's like, you know, it's like people challenging each other and then they don't listen to anything. I just think if you could be playful, uh, you must know people who are good at that. And they're positive and friendly and, and they listen, whereas most people don't listen at all. Oh, so I can't, I can't answer that. All right, uh, Peter S. You, you should know what you don't know, guys. I mean, oh my God, I'm deformed. My head goes this way, but not that way. Hey, oh, uh, this needs attending to after this. My God, that's terrible. Oh, I need rolling. Oh, sorry. It goes that way, but not that way. Oh, that's, that's bad. Okay the beginning of the end guys all right uh, yeah great uh, i'm curious um if you believe it's possible and if so how can we improvise <clears throat> with nature or non-human systems like birds or trees or streams or oceans or other intelligences like people playing jazz with birds and you know something that's maybe similar to the previous question of like not a theater situation or not a not a standard jazz quartet based on a blues progression but how do we still extend this idea of improv well, i don't think this is quite what you mean but you can certainly <clears throat> change your relationship to small children or animals if you consciously do things like break eye contact and look back. No adult ever looked away from a small child and looked back again. So it, or run, if you go, if you get divorced and you're taking your kid to the zoo, that seems to be the thing to do. You can liven up things for yourself with testing which animals are going to be responsive to breaking eye contact. I broke eye contact and looked back at the polar bears in Copenhagen Zoo and they suddenly perceived me as meat and they were clawing and raging at the bars and I had to go away because it was as if I'd thrown stones at them or something. But as for, I, don't, I, mean, I like animism as an attitude of mind, which you were sort of talking about, I think. I mean, consciousness is so weird and it, it has evolved over billions of years somehow. So maybe, yeah, I don't believe this, but the kind of ideas that come to me, which I don't believe in, <laughs> are that it's like a, a universal something or other. Yeah, I mean, before there was consciousness, there was a universe. So what sense do we make of that? I mean, ooh, I got a name from Natalie on Smirnoff on my Smirnoff on my computer. Hello. Yes, we're uh, here. Ah, hello. Yeah, we're still oh. here. Someone just mistakenly unmuted them, uh, muted themselves. Ah. Uh, you mean you couldn't hear me then? Oh, we heard you, we heard you. It wasn't a very good answer. I mean, I'm in sympathy with that. And I think it probably has a very good effect on you if you're playing jazz to a stream. But, and I like the idea, but I don't know whether it's gonna alter the temperature of the stream, which we could test. <laughs> Who was it, Oliver Sacks? at age 12 had two sets of plants and he prayed over one <laughs> and he didn't pray over the other to see if 
it had any effect. It didn't, no, but you can test things out like that. Who was it? Dalton, the early psychologist, discovered that prayer had a negative effect because the royal family got prayed over every Sunday. So he looked at the health of the royal family compared to normal middle class people and found that they were dying sooner. So he published a little pamphlet saying that prayer was negative. I thought I'd share that with you. Frederick Galton, Victorian Times, Edwardian. Okay, uh, I'm going to read a question on someone's behalf. Uh, they messaged me privately. Um, blah, blah, blah. How do you get others to play when they are not in play mode? So how to seduce people into play uh, when they're not uh, feeling playful? Well, <clears throat> be persistent, I would think. Start where they are. Uh, some people just don't want to play. I mean, think how much they've suffered not to want to play, really. I mean, if you, if you kept an ape sitting in a desk for 18 years, it would be cruelty to animals. But they don't think it's cruelty to us. Uh, what's the question? I've got gone again. I have no short term memory, as you may have noticed. Uh, the question was about play, like how to seduce people into play when they're not feeling playful. We had an imaginary hole in front of the door of my first classroom. <laughs> so pissed some people off, but some people would come in and walk around the hole, which was nice. They'd come in the door and the whole class would scream at them to be careful of the hole. But some people can't drop their status in. Therefore, they can't really play. I've often tried music sports. No, not often, but when I got to know a musician, I've often suggested it. Music sports was a great entertainment 200 years ago. When all the musicians, you couldn't be a composer if you didn't improvise. It would have been so strange. I'm a composer, but I don't improvise. No, you'd be a strange animal. I think the last great public improviser was Franz Liszt. And that's been a disaster for classical music because, I mean, Stravinsky had improvised against Bartok. <laughs> that could have led to some very interesting results. And also classical music wouldn't have lost contact in the same way that it has with the mass audience. I remember Elizabeth Lutchen saying she thought there were 200 people in England who could understand her music. And I think she was, I think it was true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a scene in, in that Mozart biography film, fiction, with Salieri as the villain. He gave lessons to Beethoven. I don't know if you know that. I mean, he was good, Salieri. But oh, Mozart changed the ch chain, redid his march. That's Amadeus. You've seen that. No? Amadeus? Most famous scene in that film, I think. But that was normal. Uh, Louis Schlosser, I can't say it. Uh, was walking in the streets in Vienna and they said, are you coming to the Impro uh, Sports tonight? There's a guy coming, he, there's a guy in from Salzburg, we're going to show him what we Viennese composers can do. And he said, no, so I got the dinner arrangement tonight. The next day, Louis Schlosser met his, Sch Schlosser met his friend again. And his friend said, whatever you do, don't accept the challenge for a little short, ugly bastard from Salzburg called Beethoven. <laughs> There's no way you can win. So that was music sports was a 
very interesting thing with very good effects and it loosened everything up and it was playful and, and savage sometimes. Uh, Beethoven once turned somebody's cello score upside down and improvised on it for an hour until the other guy left in rage. Uh, but all kinds of, most of the stuff on this is in German, unfortunately, and I don't read that. But there must be lots and lots of stuff about music improvisations. We have anyway, uh, when you talk to music, if you when you say to your musician, this is a great thing to do, they'll say, You mean I'll be judged? And you say, Well, it's a game, you get winners and losers. And then they lose interest. And actors used to be like that. It started off not with actors, that would never have happened. He started off with improvisers, with my taking my improvisation class out. Uh, if you're going to play a game, you have to be willing to lose and not to, not to become a bad loser. I mean, so part of being playful is, is give and take. And some people are just clinging on by their teeth to the wreckage and like, they can't operate in any other way. But these things are very good for neurotics, if you can get them to play them. It's been used in Vancouver and with neurotics and, and who is it? Somebody was using it in Uteborg in Sweden that I know about. No good for psychotics, but teaching neurotics and people with stuff like status transactions is very good. Gives them social skills that you know, they have no access to normally. Anyway, I've, wrote, I've written all that stuff out. People can experiment with it. I desperately tried to clarify it. it took me 10 years to write intro, mostly because I, I couldn't get the last essay to be, to fit. Uh, finally, I sent it in. I was being pestered by, yeah, you don't normally get pestered by publishers unless they paid you a lot of money and they didn't pay me any money as a as an advance so i finally sent it in can't read it now oh, i seem to be nodding off here somebody else yeah we, ha we have uh, um about 10 more minutes so we'll have maybe squeezing two more questions 92 people to go Wow. <laughs> um, Fool Jeff, you're up next. Hello. Um, I am playful. I'm playful sometimes, but I get feedback that life is serious. And the best feedback might be that life is serious play. Do you have tips for balancing the serious and the play? Life is everything. I mean, the universe is everything. I mean, if you if you select you can prove the universe is horrific or kind of ecstatic you could be Samuel Beckett or you could be William Blake I mean it's a question of which filters you put on it but is everything is uh, you do you do select your experiences. I mean, you do have a filter. Um, you like confirmation. <clears throat> we don't like to be contradicted <clears throat> unless we're going to go through some sort of revelation. Uh, so once you get set, you, where it's like all these, these Trump guys, uh, once they've sort of settled in that he's a hero, he can do pretty well anything and totally screw them up and lie and, and renege on all of his promises, but they'll still support him because it would take a huge uh, paradigm shift. I never used that word before. <laughs> a huge change to see what the guys really like. So they'll stick with him as the ship goes down. So. <clears throat> I'm not sure that's quite answering your problem, but 
you have to try stuff. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm in favor of, instead of working out how to proceed, is to keep that's the spokes of the wheel, keep going down different spokes till you get some effect. I wanted to teach children in this class of 46 kids in Battersea to enjoy writing when I it was my, it was my first class. I always give the worst class to the new teacher. It's a kind of um, initiation. So you, to destroy your dreams. You go in and spend a year with these monstrous kids that nobody else wants. But I liked them. I thought that, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it didn't work with me. Because I thought there was... I'd been a Christmas postman in Battersea, and I'd so liked the local kids that I'd talked to in the street. So I went and became a teacher in Battersea. And I had to go through some committee to vet me. <laughs> They were very interested in why I wanted to go and teach at Battersea because nobody else had put that down. They wanted to teach in middle class suburbs, but I'm losing the track again here. Uh, I was in a classroom with 46 kids. What was it? What was your question? It must relate to that. I was asking him. Oh, yes, no. I have it. I have it. It's okay. Serious, serious play. Every day, every day I went in with another method. And every day I failed. And after six weeks, I hit the jackpot. <laughs> but I couldn't have guessed before that it would have worked. I asked them to write about their dreams. Nobody had ever shown the slightest interest in their dreams. But they were fascinated by their dreams. So suddenly all these kids are wanting to write and they're yelling out words that they can't spell and I'm writing on the blackboard and I got mass enthusiasm and, and that, that, when the writing came in I began to think other teachers were playing a joke on me because I'd never seen such interesting writing from young kids but that's how I that's that, that's my method of proceeding you you don't decide on anything first you try it out and if it doesn't work, you don't persist, you try something else. It's not this, if you first don't succeed, try, try it and try again. No, if you don't succeed, give up, try something else. So I don't know, whatever your problems are, try, try lots of things. Try tickling them, that might work. I mean, who knows, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Today I'm going to tickle strangers and see if that makes them change their attitude to me. That didn't work, right? Tomorrow I'll suggest tickling them and see what happens. <laughs> All right, on Friday I'll invite them to tickle me. I mean, you just keep, <laughs> keep trying stuff. And one day you hit something really good. I mean, the status stuff, it, the trying to get normal human behavior, I've been working on for years. <laughs> Even though I knew all that stuff, it was, it was impossible to think of asking adults to change their status for some reason. Then now, of course, it's used in almost all drama schools, good drama schools, it's, a, it's universal because it's so valuable. It's so important and, you know, things like, you know, if you're an actor in a movie, it's really improvisation most of the time. I mean, you should learn this stuff. If you only play one status, you're so limited. You can only play Hamlet, you can't play the toilet cleaner or whatever. You're stuck. So I think also the status thing that, since we talked about status earlier, most important thing in status is to learn to match the other person's status. I would say that some of the questions I've been asked before, that's a good answer to. <coughs> if, you can, <coughs> if you can learn to do that, you disarm them. Uh, there's a movie, 
a movie star, yeah, he was, um, who attributed his success to this game. He tried going into agents or people like Spielberg high status and they hated him. He tried going in low status and they loved him, but they wouldn't give him any work. He tried matching status and he said, Keith, now they think I'm one of them. <laughs> now he is, yeah. So it's really important. It's not easy to match status with a high status person. I have a friend who knows this story, who occasionally emails me saying, I was trying it, I was trying it with so-and-so, but <laughs> I did it for five minutes and then I crumbled. So I would recommend to, as a basic social skill, practicing matching status. You could start off with toddlers for a start. Toddlers who teach you lots of things. They'll teach you how to smile for a start. I mean, they'll, it's quite nice to start with three-year-old kids. Share eye contact, be the same status. See, normally status as a seesaw goes up and down. But the closer you get it, the more intimate the acting gets. And the more they feel you're one of them, you're one of their people, and they don't know what's doing it. They just feel warmth towards you. They should teach it to detectives interviewing people in those little rooms. They'd confess in 20 minutes. Oh, next. <laughs> you must be, time must be almost over, my goodness. Yeah, uh, time is up, actually. Um, we have, uh, would you like one more question or would you like to end it here? No, but I'm very glad I told you that last thing because that really is the secret of training status. Be the same as the person you're talking to. And you have all kinds of techniques for moving up and down. You can keep your head stiller or you can bite your bottom lip and giggle or you can do you know, those sorts of status techniques where you can change the balance. And you can, if you become an expert on it, people like you and yeah, you're one of them. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's, a... my, that's my final advice to your <laughs> organization. You can all, next time you meet, you can all try it. You'll mm. be so suspicious of each other. <laughs> Are you doing it? No, no, not at all. Do you, do you recommend any games to, for us to play here at the STOA? Yeah, if you get about 15 or 20 people. <clears throat> it's quite good to divide them into two groups and give one group uh, some low status thing to practice and the other group some high status thing. Purely doing it from the outside. One group holds eye contact, the other group uh, breaks eye contact and takes quick looks back and you mingle and then you change around and you try three or four of these for a while. They might like dolphin training. I got it from a book by some famous, now famous animal trainer. It's what they used to do in um, SeaWorld in Florida, I think. Uh, I don't know, I've forgotten where the hell it is, wait a minute. It, uh, my filing clock is so slow these days. Uh, yeah, you get some, some quality like, we want you to take your hat off, but you don't know that. So then the audience goes beep, beep. If you go anywhere near, <clears throat> if you put your hand up in the air towards your hat, you get lots of beeps. Such a simple game. They used to make people do that until they were good at it, before they let them anywhere near a dolphin except to clean the tank. Uh, so that was their basic training for dolphin trainers. And they were good because you, you had dolphins that could be out of the water with their tail going like an outboard motor. No, no, 
a dolphin had ever done that since the history of the world. That your audience would be very bad at beeping people. <laughs> they'll beep them to put their hands up here. I mean, they'll, they'll be, and you tell the person who's playing the game that it's not for them the training the audience. <laughs> that gives them more confidence. But that's an important game and it's great to start any session off with. Puts people in a good mood. A dolphin training. I bet if you, it's probably on the internet, everything's on the internet. But I never typed in dolphin training. I typed in Keith Johnstone in Cabbage the other day. And yet yeah, there it is, Keith Johnstone in Cabbage. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Oh. This I live too long, really, and this technology is all too weird. I mean, come on. I did want to die at 72. That's before all this new technology got started. And that's 15 years ago. I totally failed. Oh. I failed at everything except teaching improvisation. And I never wanted to do that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Oh. Well, all right, all right Keith, uh, I think we'll end here. Um, any closing thoughts for us here at the store? No, I'll keep, <laughs> I, I keep dribbling on for ages. <laughs> the well, obvious, we want the obvious. We all taught that what we have inside us isn't good enough. And we the obvious is so difficult. Yeah, that status was the obvious. It took me ah, such a long time. I think I started in 68. <laughs> I did it finally in about 62. God, and as soon as you find it, of course, of course, it's so obvious. <laughs> but teachers, teachers, teachers don't respect the obvious. Yeah, I, that, I would like that as a bumper sticker. <laughs> if you think of something clever to say, say something else. That's what I tell improvisers, because I'm hunting for the obvious. Think inside the box, for God's sake. If you think outside the box, no one can work with you. This is a good spot to end. Um, thank you so much, Keith, for it's coming to the store. Nice. Uh, we'd love to have you back anytime you'd like. Oh, I have absolutely nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, we're going to close out here. Uh, I dropped some links in the chat, the website for more events, the Patreon, and uh, the Substack. We have an event coming up tonight called Communitas Club, where we're launching a new series where we investigate various conversations. And we're definitely going to um, do some status games here at the STOA. We'll figure it out. Bye, -bye. Uh, bye Keith. I don't know how to get rid of you. <sighs> You're stuck with us. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing every button. I can't find the door. Yes, that's right. That's a good Strange game. Room with no oh, I found the mute. Yeah, there. Right, right next to the invisible. Bye bye. Hole. But, but. <laughs> What's happening? Okay, everyone, I'm going to play some music so we can just all enjoy this together.